Our guest this morning is the real life version of the most interesting man in the world. We welcome noted New York City author Robert Daly to the show. Bob, how is everything going in Bronxville? So great to see you. Everything's going well. Nice sunny day, et cetera. So, I mean, this has been something that's been in the works uh, for me to have you here on the show. Of course, I'm such a big fan. I, I think I could feel, I mean, so many hours about your amazing career, your life, 91 years young. You attend Fordham Prep. I mean, you have a big connection to the Bronx, New York City. Eventually, of course, Fordham, you graduated in 1951. You went on to serve in the Air Force before really landing this amazing first job. I'd say a golden era of the National Football League as the PR man for the New York Giants. Impressive for a 23-year-old. You've gone on to, to write 31 books, six of which have become adapted for film. Enjoyed a memorable career, of course, as a New York Times foreign correspondent, six years based in France, but covering stories uh, really from Russia to Ireland and everywhere in between 15 or more countries in all. And then, of course, much later, you end up serving as the New York Police Department deputy commissioner. And that experience becomes the basis for the New York Times bestseller Prince of the City and Target Blue. Uh, what a, just what an absolutely amazing career. Those are just some of the highlights of your career, Bob. Is there one during your professional career that you were most proud of? Well, first of all, you're very flattering. Thank you. What am I most proud of? Boy, I don't know. So much of it just happened. Uh, I mean, my parents were friends with Jack Mara, who owned the Giants in the uh, what was it, 1953? Pro football was nothing. The biggest crowd that season was 30,000 people, and there were 7,000 season tickets. So the idea of a 23-year-old publicity director made no, no trouble for anybody. You know, no one was interested. And uh, until they started to win, nobody was interested in me or what I was trying to put out there either. But it, it went on from there. I've been, I have been very lucky, yes. I mean, that experience with the Giants, too, I mean, that ends up being the basis for one of one of the great sport sports books of all time. At least that's what uh, the time Sports Illustrated had called it. I mean, how were you able to take all of those experiences that you really deeply immersed yourself in and find ways to to tell them in these unbelievable narratives? I don't know. The football experience, which lasted six years, was very intense. And then uh, it ended. I mean, I ended it but what was I going to do next? Well, I could get a contract for writing a novel about it because it was a hot subject. Nobody knew whether I could write a novel or not, but anyway, it was a hot subject. It was just starting out to be a hot subject. And uh, I happened to be in on the ground floor, okay. And then from there, uh, I, I sort of worked all of these things into future jobs and better jobs. And each time, uh, falling in love with whatever the subject was, the, the Giants, uh, the police department, uh, foreign correspondence ship, if I can say that. So uh, basically, I, I always wanted to be a writer. That's all I ever wanted to be. And so when I reached a certain point in any of these jobs, what, how can I make this into a novel? I wanted to become the greatest novelist who ever lived. And okay, I didn't make it, but neither did anybody else. So that's okay. And well, I mean, Bob, I think you're selling yourself uh, short. <laughs> well, you're very kind. No, and as, as I just mentioned, I mean, so many of these books, you know, grow out of uh, pretty much you immersing yourself deeply and studying people and subjects that, that really seem to fascinate you, whether it was Grand Prix racing or opera or bullfights. And uh, one of the discussions that you and I have had is really just how some of these personalities are very much very similar, whether it's uh, an F1 driver or even a bullfighter. Yeah, they are. Bullfighter and, and uh, Formula One driver, even to the danger. But uh, the, and a bullfighter basically is just an athlete or a dancer. Think of them as a dancer. They're very beautiful dancers to watch and uh, et cetera. What can I find in these things? I fell in love with them all. Love really is the, is the uh, answer. If you love something, you see everything. You immerse yourself in it. You keep asking questions. You want more, more. And then when you're overflowing, it flows out onto the page. At least it did with me. That's, that's just so excellent, Bob. And I, I know 
from speaking with you, I, I think you could tell my, my passion for racing and motorsport and in particular Formula One. And, and to me, you've written like the holy grail of Formula One books. And this, uh, this book here, The Cruel Sport, uh, this is an original copy from 1963. And then, you know, you end up uh, re-releasing it and in the mid-2000s. It's another, uh, for the fans at home, another, another version of it, uh, an updated version of it that has some more stories and a great prologue. Uh, by Bob. I mean, uh, you know, but it's actually, you wrote two books about the formative one years of uh, Formula One, and, you know, both are great. The latter one, like I said, I think is uh, pretty much the holy grail of F1 books, and not just because of your writing in the book, but also because of so many of these photographs that you took, and the title actually came from the legendary late great racer Dan Gurney. How did the cruel sport come about? He went off the road in Holland, I think, and killed a spectator. And he looked down at the body and he said, this is a cruel sport. I heard that and I said, that's my title. Um, again, nobody was interested in America in Grand Prix racing. Nobody even knew it existed until I came along and I'm looking for a job on the New York Times in Europe, my wife being French and I was in love with Europe too. How do I stay there? How do I work there? And so I suggested the Times, that I'd be the European sports correspondent and that car racing, Formula One racing, would be my staple. It'd be uh, eight or 10 or maybe more races a year. And in between, I'd write about other things, including bullfighting, which the poison pen, the uh, animal lovers sent many, many poison pen letters to the New York Times. And I had to write about it only obliquely. For instance, an article about the end of the season and so many of the bullfighters are wounded going into the off season, et cetera. You know, you can, if you want to do something, it seems to me you can figure out a way to get paid for doing it. And that was the key thing. I had to be paid if I was going to keep doing it. I couldn't do it just for fun because I didn't have that, any kind of money at all. You ended up actually uh, meeting your wife that very first day in France. And uh, three months later, you guys, uh, that's, you know, were that's official, right? married. Again, that's luck. I, I met her the afternoon of the first day, and uh, that was 67 years ago. And uh, talk about never looking back. Well, I've looked back many times, but it, it, it happened that way. I was just very lucky, and then lucky to be able to find a way to, to stay in France and get paid for it. Wow. Uh, you know, Bob, I, I really don't think it's, it's luck. I mean, I think it's your drive, your perseverance, and you know, for you to be able to even kind of sell yourself at that time, making $50 an article or the editor of the Times telling you at that time that if you go and get yourself a camera, we'll pay an extra $15 for every uh, photo that gets printed in the Times. I mean, you, you seem to have the drive, the passion, and like you said, really motivated to become this all-time great author. You know, you asked what I'm most proud of. I think it's becoming, I think, a good photographer. $15 per photo, maybe I'd get one a week in the paper. Well, 15 bucks was big money to me that year. And then I fell in love with taking pictures, with, with, with seeing these events through a camera, you know, standing at a corner on a Grand Prix circuit and getting close-ups of the driver's faces, which you could do with, with the lenses of those days. And nobody else had ever done that. And I wanted to do it. In a certain sense, I would have done it whether I got paid or not. Now, in truth, I could not have stayed there day after day, year after year, if I hadn't been paid. You have to make a living. Every day of your life, everybody has to make a living. And I found a way to do it even at $15 a photo. I don't know how many hundreds of photos I had in the New York Times. I had a cover of Newsweek once. The Art Institute of Chicago had this exhibition in the Baltimore Museum and a, a museum in New York called uh, the New York Gallery of Art or something like that. And there are hundred or more photos in this exhibition and 15 or so of them were mine. Boy, I, I'm very pleased with that. That was part one of our conversation with legendary author Robert Daly. Tune in next Monday for part two.